basically what we're going to try to go over today is how a design sprint works. Um, obviously in an hour there's no way to effectively even do an accelerated one. We did a workshop on Thursday and even with three hours um, it was really hard to get five days of work done in that time period. So we built in a lot of efficiencies for that workshop um, and we got a lot of outcomes from the group, some of, of y'all here, uh, that <coughs> did that where we ended up with storyboards and stuff so we made a prototype out of that. So we're going to show you that whole process. Um, but before we get into that, I gave everyone index cards because one of the key elements of a sprint and like any workshop session that you probably do at work, there's the sticky note time where everyone like gets around the table and, so, and scopes out a project or tries to define a problem space. In this particular case, the problem space we're dealing with is the digital presence or the advanced presence in general of code on the beach before anyone gets here, like before the event starts. So that whole bridge of time from when someone first learns about code on the beach through getting their tickets, through planning out what they're going to do, all the way to day one um, here in the resort is this area of time that we're focused on. So on those cards, you don't have to do it now, through, we'll, we're going to get to a risks and assumptions part where we explain risks and assumptions a little bit more, but we want to write down any challenge that you came up to. We don't need a list of them. I want you to just kind of think of whatever the top challenge is that you experienced between the time that you found out about Code on the Beach and before you walked in the door. So I know that you probably had, like, I wish there were more information here, or I wish the website were better, or whatever. Um, pick whatever you think is, like, kind of the strongest point that was really a point of frustration for you and write that down as the challenge in the, that, that you think needs to be addressed. Just one thing. Just one thing. That was the big deal. <laughs> so, um, my opinion's This is Ian. Oh, hey. Introduction. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, we're we're cool. Ian we're cool. is a um, UX director, and I'm a content strategist, so we're highly UX focused. Um, we uh, learned this whole process. I mean, we learned it ourselves. We've done them before, but we actually got formal um, Google Sprint training. Um, from an organization out west that came and, and trained us, and we just really love doing workshops. Like, we really enjoy this design thinking process, and so I hope that this will give you some exposure into that and help you maybe speak, speak design a little bit. I know that that's a big, we were talking about this the other night, that like, it's like a kitchen and a um, wait staff, right? So you've got your developers that actually make the things, and then you've got your wait staff that is out there making promises, right? And those are, that's a hard, communication to have, you know, when the food comes back and the waiter's mad and the developer is mad, like, <laughs> that's the kind of thing that we see happening a lot in digital environments, and we think this kind of hopefully will also give you some insight into the design side. Um, before we go forward, is anyone in here, is anyone a designer, number one? No? One designer, cool. Thanks, Welcome. <laughs> uh, and has anyone else done design sprints in their org? Worked in design sprints? Okay, so I don't know why I came, but welcome. Uh, <laughs> hopefully there will be something here that, that is useful. Um, so when we, when we kick off a design sprint, if you're facilitating, and I encourage everyone to try it if you haven't, because you learn a lot. You even learn, like, just learning whether or not this works for your organization is really helpful. Um, but if you're facilitating something, you always ask permission to facilitate. Uh, it's really, it's not a super formal thing. There's no I or nay kind of thing. It's just, do you guys, are you guys cool with us? facilitating this uh, session, and you say, yes, we are cool with it. And then that allows us to cut you off, keep things moving, keep us focused, it's tell you to complex. shut up and stuff yeah. like that uh, in, in a polite way. But um, that's the Hopefully purpose of there. Your culture and <clears throat> yeah, judgment. yeah. Um, so John, tell us what a design sprint is. Yeah, so a design sprint is just this really established way to kind of get all of the stakeholder uh, ideas in a room, understand the problem space, the people involved with the problem, and really kind of crack through as many po potential solutions as you can until you kind of come to a consensus. It's really to bring everyone to kind of a consensus on what we're going to build, and then create a prototype of that and test it with real people so that you know if how many of your assumptions were wrong, right? And that way you get through a bunch of the like low-hanging fruit assumptions. Come on in. You get through a bunch of uh, the low-hanging fruit assumptions. You get to get through a lot of the challenges that maybe are just because this person knows things this person doesn't. You get a lot of information before you do a line of code. So it happens in a five-day sprint, and these are the elements. 
So uh, you need certain people in the room to conduct a sprint and get a good outcome, uh, one that's feasible for your org. Um, your primary attendees would, of course, be people that may be founders, especially if you're working in a really small group. You want the founders present. Any board members might be insightful. Your designers or a representative of the design team, maybe your you know, head of design or director. Um, Engineers, of course, need to be represented. Um, you can do junior engineers, you can do your CTO, what have you. It all depends on you know, what problem you're trying to solve. Um, and marketers. There's no like, specific list of people you need to invite. It's just people that you think are relevant to the problem. Optionally, you can uh, invite SMEs, subject matter experts, if you're not familiar with that terrible name. Uh, partners, um, clients, if you want to do something that's co-creation about solving a problem. Um, and then maybe even users. Um, so if, you're, if you've got something you know, user-facing, you have users that are like power users, they might know your product better than you do. Um, and those are people you can invite. Ideally, you want to have about seven people. That seems to be the optimal way to, within five days, arrive at consensus. Um, if you feel like you're, you need more than that, think about who you could use as experts and bring them in just for interviews to get their input, and then like, you know, catch them up on the output later. And your experts can be like a, a person like that is at your company that really feels some ownership of whatever feature or product that you're making, even though they might not be a stakeholder, they, ha they feel they have a stake in it. So this gives them a chance to come in and kind of get their thumbprint on the thing. It's yeah. also a great opportunity if you, anytime you can get end users or the real like customers that are going to be using the thing, if you can get someone in that league, someone that lives in the problem. Customer space, support is a really good yeah. uh, place to go for that. Um, so the roles of a sprint are essentially you want to have a facilitator like what, what Ian and I did on Thursday and are kind of doing today. It can be anyone though. It's really easy to train up on this. There's lots of free materials out there. GV.com slash sprint will have all five days laid out and um, we will send everyone out materials after we're done that um, give you all of those references so you don't have to worry too much about writing it all down. Uh, we'll get this all back to you. Um, but the facilitator is the one that keeps things moving, and keeps you on time. The recorder is usually one of the facilitators, so you usually have a pair of facilitators because while one person's kind of setting up the activities and the pieces, the other person has to be documenting everything that you did in the last piece so that at the end of the sprint, you kind of have documentation of all the ideas that came up, every sticky note, every, like have everything like documented there so you can always refer back to it or share it company-wide. Yeah, ABC, always be capturing. That's what that means. So. And then the hippo. Uh, so, like in most circumstances, there's the decider, you know, the executive or the principal stakeholder or the client that's in the sprint, so that when everything's decided, like this is what your team decides they want to move on with, they can say yay or nay to that. They get the power to uh, break ties or like just to be the super voter, be like, you guys, like, I hear everything that you're saying about all this stuff, but I like this idea and it's what we're going to do. Um, you have to give that person that power, otherwise you're really just making something for yourself. They know what the needs are better. Uh, so some ground rules. These are phrases if we're actually conducting this, but to squeeze five days into an hour is probably more taxing on you guys than us, and we don't want to do that. So uh, let's pretend like this is real. Number one is this is a sprint. We need to move fast, hence the name. Uh, they'll need to, we'll need to cut you off. We'll need to, you know, uh, move conversations around, postpone things. It's nothing personal when that happens. Make that clear to the people you're working with if you are facilitating. Um, if you want to be here, be here. Uh, this, acquire, this requires a lot of presence, right, and attention. It's long. It, you know, we, we have to break it up a lot because these things get, um, they can snowball. Uh, so if you need to take a call, things like that, just step out, take a call. But otherwise, no devices, no laptops, no nothing. It's all handwritten, analog stuff. And it's so easy to say that, but you guys all know what meetings are like. Everyone's got their laptop in front of them. Everyone's half paying attention, but they also have to keep an eye on the QA log or whatever. You know what I mean? There's always something that's going on, but it really is important to like have full focus because that just one minute of code shift to like, oh, I've got to reply to this email. Now I'm back in the sprint. Like that takes you out of the game and that slows down the whole process. So it's just really etiquette for everyone in the sprint that everyone is fully committed because it's expensive to have you all in a meeting five days. <laughs> yeah. Outcomes, John? So the outcomes that we'll get from this is you'll get the digital fundamentals that we're going through today. Um, you'll get to, we'll even send you out the link to uh, all the storyboards that we did and you're going to get to see the user test outlines and you'll have even access to the copy of the prototype that we designed after the workshop we did on Thursday. 
So this is the <coughs> overall breakout of how a weekly sprint goes. So you can see that it's a lot of stuff, and each of these are a bunch of things within them, right? Like understanding the goals isn't like we just say it, like there's an exercise to really understand it. So each of these days are a full day of like all day work. Um, uh, in some cases, there can be a Thursday gap where you don't need everyone because you just have design kind of working on everything that you've done up till then. But other than that, like everyone should count on being involved each day because there's a lot to do and every, all of it has stake. So you start off with defining a goal, that's your sprint goal, and usually it's something that you have uh, up, visible at all times, so you can always refer back to it and make sure that you're staying on track. Um, the goal is to identify a critical problem for this scenario is to identify a critical problem in the, in the advanced guest experience for attendees of Code on the Beach and develop a prototype of a potential solution for testing. Um, <clears throat> this year, hopefully, our output will actually inform next year, so you all have a chance to make this easier on yourselves if you want to go back. Um, <clears throat> but that's our goal for this year. And since this whole conference is for you guys, you're the best people to like, help give us feedback. And um, you're not, I'm sure you're not eager to like answer surveys, so it's great to have you like in here where we can get it tacked out. But this is, you want to know the mission of your organization. If you're doing it in your own organization, this might not be as critical of a part. This is more if you're doing it with a partner or you just, you have to get people in the room kind of behind the company's mission. Code on the Beach's mission is to create an accessible, affordable developer conference that facilitates intensive high quality sessions on software engineering topics from cloud and mobile services while being just steps from the beach. So our org breakdown uh, for Code on the Beach, and you'll want to do this with individual uh, organizations as you facilitate or are participating in these things, is really look at who is influential in the decision-making process. Um, for Code on the Beach, we are a nonprofit business league. Um, there's a board of directors, there are specialist volunteers, and then there are non-specialized volunteers. So like John and I are specialized volunteers, but we have people that are helping out with registration that aren't necessarily specialized. Um, our sponsors are, of course, part of our organization. Those are our partners. So the local tech community and occasionally uh, international corporations are also uh, in there. And then our other stakeholders are actually speakers. So the developers, programmers, designers, product managers, et cetera, um, that comprise our speakers are partnering with us. Um, so we need to be cognizant of their needs as we craft a solution. So the problem space is really what is the challenge that got you in the room? There was a trigger that got everyone in there, whether it's a new feature, new product, whatever. And then you have to study the space the problem is existing in, right? So you have to know who is experiencing it, the user, who the user is, or, or, or who's actually doing the thing, and what the thing is they can't accomplish with any current existing system. And so these are some questions that help you get in there. What are the data and analytics telling us? Um, what isn't being communicated adequately? What calls to action are, are we asking them to do the right things in the right places? Draw UX elements. So we, in this case, did a survey that we sent out to all registered attendees in advance of the thing. We didn't get a statistically significant response. We got 22 responses. But for the sake of the exercise, we're going to pretend this is statistically significant data <laughs> so that we understand how it works. Um, so out of the 22 people that answered, we found that 57% of the attendees are junior to intermediate, 24% are senior developers, and only 9.5% are tech managers. This is one data from a whole bunch of data that we put on the wall for the workshop, but I put this up because this seemed to be the one that compelled people in the workshop the most. And an important note here is that these tech managers are buying most of these tickets. So the person that pays for the thing is different than the person that actually uses the thing in this case. So we also want to have some guide rails of focusing questions as we dive into the problem a bit deeper and start to move towards solutions. Um, number one is, are we asking the right questions for registrants? Um, again, you can, we'll get into personas that all have different questions. Um, do registrants and attendees have the same goals? Again, this is something that's uh, we can refer to personas to figure out um, how do we continue to engage post-registration? Um, and how do we compare to other similar conferences as far as registration onboarding? Finding, uh, doing some kind of competitive audit or finding analogous experiences um, is super helpful when you're crafting a solution because it can inspire you to do some things that you might not be thinking of within the realm of your own product. Getting into other products helps you kind of expand that. The persona, actually I'm gonna let you take personas because okay. you're good at that. Okay. Uh, Have you guys worked with personas? Anyone worked with personas before? So a few people? Okay. So uh, in a sprint, we're not using like marketing personas per se. 
Uh, we're using more digital-based personas, so it's more about behavior and not necessarily like this, per this person watches Sex in the City and drinks flirtinis or whatever. It's not that like granular. We don't need to be, it's not a motivation for an actor. Um, they are really just for us to help empathize and get in the, the mindset of the user when they're using our product. Um, they want, we want to understand their unique perspective um, and we want to be able to craft these in a really simplistic way, um, which is, what is it, the mouse? Yeah, it was the arrow. It used to disappear and now it stopped. <laughs> um, so, Generally, you can come up with a persona for you know, any number of your clients or, or users by asking what is this person thinking, doing, and feeling in a particular situation. And we break that down later into what's called a journey map. Uh, but for now, let's just look at the personas that we have identified. We only pulled a couple of the ones that we looked at. We really looked at three in the workshop, but I'll show you two of them now because Software Engineers represents a good portion of them. And we get kind of like their age range, what their technology acumen is. Um, the expectations is really important. Like what do they expect when they're coming to come on the beach? And at what point do they expect those things? And then you want to know a little bit about what's, what they're strong at, what their motivations are, and what they're scared of is important. It's really important to be really frank in a sprint. Like it's got to be gloves off. And, um, and that means being really frank about what your users might hate about your product and, um, or feature. So, these are some of the things that personas do. And then our other persona, we hadn't originally counted on, but when we got the data and we saw that like, management was this big, important part of it, we put together a persona for uh, Mr. Manager here. Um, and the, the, age range is, the age range is really off based on the picture. Well, right? it, like, now he's that old. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, this is really important. Those two next to each other is really important because this person is so different than the software engineer. Like, Everything that they're strong at is opposite. Everything that, that motivates them and that they're scared of is very different than what the developer is. So we have to remember that to keep both of these players in mind. So the next part of Monday is your expert interview. And like I mentioned, you can use people that are already on your team that don't really have a place in the sprint, the core team for a sprint, but might have a lot of knowledge to share. Um, Anyone that's dealt with the problem firsthand. So this is, again, I want to reinforce customer support is really important here. If, you, if you're not including them otherwise, this is essential. Um, some rules for when you're doing expert interviews are to be investigative. Um, you know, don't pretend to know anything. You can come in there with like and explain it to me like I'm five kind of mindset. Um, don't, don't assume you know everything about your own product. Um, also embrace ambiguity. Don't. Like, don't worry about diving into rabbit holes. This is really your best opportunity to do so uh, during the whole sprint. Um, use it to get to know the consumer when you have experts in front of you. Um, and then you're going to want to use this information to inform the customer journey or user journey um, as you progress. So take notes on like what are the big milestones uh, um, when a user is interacting with my product, you know, when do I get their attention? When do they make a, a decision? When, what's conversion look like? Things like that. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, ask what has worked uh, or hasn't worked in the past uh, to make sure that you're not treading over any ground that has already been uh, terrible. So we actually did uh, expert interviews on Thursday with the founders of Code on the Beach. They came in and let the groups in the workshop ask a few questions. And um, that really gave us a lot of insights that I think ended up driving what the, the groups decide, the direction the groups decide to take. So the next step would be to assemble. Um, in this case, we're not going to break into teams. We did that uh, on Thursday. But we'll tell you about the teams that formed on Thursday. It was Team A plus and Team, formerly known as Team B, Team A plus uh, plus. <laughs> Uh, so so um, that helped us identify people. You don't always have to break into groups <laughs> in a design. Sometimes it's good to do exercises where you like kind of diverge and then converge. But um, in this case, we had to because out of efficiency. Of yeah. And, and Sometimes in scenarios where you actually have two really good solutions and you want to prototype them simultaneously and test them simultaneously, you'll also break up. It's not recommended, though. And if you're doing it for the first time, pretty much never do that because it's impossible to manage. But you can if you need to. Yeah, once, you get, once you're comfortable with facilitating, I, I think it's fun to do the divergent one, but I, it, it's fun in practice. It's not fun in deliverables. <laughs> <laughs> um, so journey mapping is like a critical part of Monday. It's where you're understanding exactly where the person is experiencing the problem 
Um, and so we've already like, gapped ours that it's just before the festival starts, right? So that's our end line. And then you'd work backwards from that to try to find the very first touch point that when does someone first find out about this? How do they first hear about it? What brings them in at the beginning? And then what are all of the touch points along the path that they have to interface with uh, your product or your campaigns or just your brand in some way? Um, so that you can all be focused in and make sure that not only are you solving the right problem, but you're solving it in the right context and in the right place. Um, pro tip is to use post-its instead of just writing it down because you'll be rearranging it all the time. Just make sure that your stuff is modular and able to uh, be reconfigured. Um, <clears throat> this is not necessarily a sprint deliverable, but it is a really good way of figuring out what those um, steps may be if you just want to get it down to like five steps. Um, if you guys have seen the terrible movie, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, there's a scene where he says, A-I-D-A, attention, uh, interest, decision, action. Uh, that's kind of the way this is broken down, but in nicer terms. Uh, this is called the five E's of a user journey, which is entice, enter, engage, exit, extend. And you talk about the touch points, which are like the channels. So it, you could start at a billboard, even if you have a digital product. It could start at a billboard or a magazine advertisement or in someone's tweet. It doesn't have to start in the product. Um, and then you'll map it to these goals that they have at every juncture. And then measure sentiment. Um, like a good way to, this, this is all textual, but if you want to like get fun with it and make it interesting for others to read. We often replace sentiment with emojis just because they're way more expressive. Um, and you don't have to stick to someone being happy, neutral, or sad, which is like the, the normal range. With emojis, they can be like blowing kisses or whatever you it want. It also gives you like a regularized <laughs> set, you know? Like everyone might use different adjectives, but they're all going to use the same smiley face if they feel smiley face. You right. Know? This is your so uh, risks and assumptions. Uh, the cards that we uh, gave you are to participate in risks and assumptions. We haven't actually coded anything for the website of next year, so we are going to make a new website for next year. We know that that's a big sore thumb on that. So um, all of the input that you guys um, give us on these cards today will be considered as we're moving forward with the um, with the whole project. But um, in this case, what you want to do is you want to be, you want to say the things that you probably are usually afraid to say about your own product or features or work. You want to be highly critical, like this is your chance to just put like all of your worst fears on the wall and uh, make sure they're being addressed when you get into the sprint. So some examples of risks and assumptions. This is coming from starting with assumptions and then you might go and like map these to a risk level. Welcome. Uh, so these are all assumptions we make about the Code on the Beach experience. Um, some, they can be really simple too, like the Code on the Beach website is online and functional. That's an assumption. Maybe it's not. <laughs> some people said it wasn't when they tried to register. So um, we're also making the assumption that users are interested in speakers. We're making the assumption that people give the speakers credibility. And lots of these um, assumptions are legacy assumptions, right? Like this, uh, attendees want to bring their families. When we first did, were doing discovery with Code on the Beach about like what what is what are the, what are the things like they said oh people like to bring their families did any, did anyone here bring their family one two three so the, I'm, we're not saying it's an irrelevant problem but we're like is that an assumption like that has to be like tested you can't just build the whole thing around like the, we do a Disney cruise when that's only three people that benefit from that you know right so then you map these to the riskiest assumptions which you know. The idea of the site being online, that's not a risky assumption. It's probably got 99% uptime. Um, some of you may argue that. But uh, <laughs> then we'll move into, we'll take those, and we tricked you. Those aren't risks. Those are opportunities. John, tell us what an opportunity really looks like. Yeah, so um, everything that you just wrote down is like, oh, man, the website sucks, or whatever, becomes an opportunity to make a great website. Those, every single one of those is a challenge that someone really experienced. And so now you're going to look at all those challenges and say, like, what is realistic for us to tackle in this time period? And that'll, like, what are, what are most important? And that'll do it. What themes are there that are emerging on their own? And then that's ways to kind of group them. And just through the process of looking at all those risks and assumptions, you start working towards, uh, you understand the problem space well enough to articulate it in uh, the form of a how might we question. The trickiest thing about the how might we question is finding the balance of it not being too broad so that it's like make the festival better and not being too specific so that it's like make the festival better by 
creating a prototype, I mean, by creating a Android app that helps you know when uh, cornhole is going on. That's too specific. Um, <coughs> you don't want to like write, create the prototype in the question. You know, you want to leave enough room that ideas can emerge. This is the one that uh, was written by the uh, A++ team. Uh, but both teams actually came to the same problem space um, independently. No one was cross-working. They both looked at the data independently. They both talked to each other about the problems and risks and assumptions. And both groups decided, like, this is an important thing to solve. Um, so that's the one we went forward with on Monday. Uh, <clears throat> so we arrived there, though, through voting. Um, now we're on Tuesday, right? This is the beginning of yes, Tuesday? Yes, it's uh, the beginning of Tuesday. Uh, so you'll vote on your how might we's. You should have a ton of them because you're guaranteed to write some terrible ones at first. Um, the, it's going to take a long time to get to a place where you feel really comfortable with writing them because they'll always have some like specificity or being too broad um, until you get really good at them. Uh, but you'll, you'll have an opportunity to vote on them as a group. Uh, so each, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, each attendee gets three sticky dots, you know, those little like highlighter colored dots. Um, and you're going to put them on the, H the how might we's or HMWs, as we'll say moving forward, um, that you like and that you want to investigate and probe into. Um, <clears throat> you can vote on the same ones. They're non-binding. You can move them around if you change your mind. You can just do whatever you want with them. You can put them all on your own if you want to, if but you feel that boxed. strongly about it. But it is time boxed. So at the end of that, um, if you don't have a solution that everyone's gravitated toward, that's usually when you'll have a tiebreaker that's done by a, the decider, so the founder or whoever. Um, and then you'll use that how might we, in this case this one, to pick a persona and target a portion of your journey map. So clearly you guys can probably intuit that where we went was serving the tech manager persona and getting uh, the registration process itself right. Lightning demos are a really, really fun part of a sprint. Usually on Monday, the facilitator will give you a little bit of homework on your way out. They'll say, like, you know, look around online, like Ian was talking about earlier. Find analogous scenarios where they're dealing with the same problem, even if it's outside of your comp, your comp set. Like, it's obvious, like, let's go see how the competition is handling this. But then it's really interesting to say, like, okay, well, we're a conference, but music festivals have a lot of similarities, so how do they solve this problem? And that'll really like get your mind going in different places. And then you bring all of those um, in, and during the session on Tuesday, um, you'll, ever, like, you'll go through, you'll say, oh, my favorite one was uh, Google I.O. Like how they do theirs seemed really good. So then the facilitator will be like, tell me what you liked about the Google I.O. interface. And as they talk through it, you would write down, the facilitator would write all these down and put these stickies right under the printout or the drawing that you do of the um, site. And you do this for every single person's analogs until you get through it all. You find a lot of things, you find when people bring the same things in, like that's interesting, it's almost already a vote, you know? And when people bring really outside ideas in that can really like jar things up and make you think about things entirely different. It's a fun part. So uh, for our lightning demos yesterday, uh, the way that we kind of saved a little bit of time was to pre-bake these. And so John and I put together a couple uh, conferences and uh, you know, like Outside Lands is actually a music conference. Disrupt isn't necessarily a code conference. Um, but we put these together and we just picked out some screenshots that we thought were influential in the customer journey, and we put them up in black and white. Uh, the reason that they're okay in black and white, obviously in practice, you could have them up on the screen and everyone's looking at the, the live working thing. But the idea of uh, just using black and white helps you isolate the content that's really important because we're not really going into design necessarily, like visual design. We're designing a solution. I like but this it's, one because it's blue. Right, yeah, that happens. <laughs> and you know you'll have, you know you'll have like, the CEO in there, and he'll be like, that is my favorite color. We're going to do that one. <laughs> and this gets, gets that out of that space. So um, that's some ways that you can, hello. You can come in. You can come in. I'm actually looking for the person who's over this. We have an eight. Oh. Oh, OK. Sorry. <clears throat> OK. So after lightning demos.
Oh yeah, no, so notes and ideas are just the time that like now you've looked at all of this data about the problem, you've looked at other ways, other people sign it, you've looked into who your personas are, you understand the prob problem space, but only in this really crash coursey way, right? You've spent one day talking about all this stuff and now you're starting to brew with ideas and you're ready to like get down. So this is the point where you take a time box set of time, like 10 minutes, 30 minutes, it depends on you know, how much data you're working with and, and how much time you need, but to go around, look at everything you've already put on the wall, look at all the lightning demo stuff, look at everything and kind of just start writing down what thoughts are emerging for you. What, what ways do you think you can approach this particular, how might we, with this particular audience knowing what you know at that point? Yeah, so these are also, just to remember, these are just for individuals. They're not going up on the wall. This is just your inspiration and your own observations from the data you've ingested. Additionally, Everyone will celebrate this time in the sprint because this is a time where you can use your phone during research. So notes is when you can look up things, like if something reminded you of like, oh, th that's a lot like this part of this app that I love. That's where you can go back and reflect on that and no one will tell you to put it down. So the next exercise is Crazy Eights. Um, the group Thursday really <clears throat> liked Crazy Eights, right? Yeah, Crazy Eights was the best part. You guys got really into it, but I think some of the guys were kind of scared of it. So it's, it's called Crazy Eights because of the timing of it. It's not that you make wacky ideas necessarily. You can, you can do whatever you want. Um, but you're basically gonna take a, a sheet of paper um, and that's just so we don't like, you don't get too absorbed in one thing. You kind of confine it to one sheet and break it up into eight compartments. However you wanna fold it, draw it on there, nobody cares. But you gotta, you gotta take one sheet of paper and compartmentalize it into eight sheets. And then for one minute intervals, you're going to draw you're gonna illustrate your idea, whatever concept you have that you think is gonna be a good part of a solution sketch. You're not doing like whole website thumbnails, applications inside this. Just focus on the components that you think are necessary, ideas that you need to flesh out, things that you know are gonna look wrong the first time you put pen to paper, this is the time to get it perfected. You can draw new things every sheet, you can draw the same thing and iterate on it in the eight minutes that you have, but this is time to really get also really get comfortable with just uh, translating your ideas to paper and a visual kind of representation. And thinking about it from a user-based side, right? So this isn't just like charting out how the functionality will happen in the back. This is like this user, the tech manager that we're focused on, this problem, how will they interface with this technology? Right, and again, these are just for individuals. So these aren't going up on the walls. It's, it's for just your- Just getting ready for storyboarding. Yeah, so here's a scene of uh, our participants uh, doing crazy eights. Mm -hmm. Good work, John. You're like Ansel Adams. I am, I am. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. um, so the next bit is solution sketching. Um, <clears throat> this is where we take things to the next level and things get hardcore. Um, you'll wanna craft a storyboard of your solution. We usually limit this to like three frames. It doesn't mean you have to work digitally. Maybe it, like your story starts with um, a billboard or a banner ad or a, an email, um, but this is the time to illustrate that, uh, that these three core components of your um, solution. Um, <clears throat> you don't want to focus on every detail. Like if you find yourself uh, doing solution sketches and you've got like Greek text in it or like writing little blobs that represent text, you've gone too far. You don't have to worry about that. Just get the core stuff in so that people will understand it when they look at it. Um, you also wanna add any notes that help convey parts of your storyboard. So if you need to draw the connection from one frame to another, this is important then, then because when you share this, and this will be shared, you don't get to explain it up front. Um, <clears throat> you, it needs to be strong enough to stand on its own. Um, so you should have tons of notes under it, you should have tons of notes around it, highlight things that you think are important, highlight things uh, uh, that motivated you to make those decisions, um, and then name it too. Um, and try to name it something creative so that people can get behind it, because if you all have like a very homogenous naming system, I'm not gonna name team A++, names, A++, A++, plus plus A plus. A+ and all of their business tech uh, bulk um, registration yeah. titles, they almost had the same name, so you couldn't tell the difference. But try to make it really personal to you and, and come up with something creative in the last couple seconds you have, um, even if it's like the name of your dog. You need to be the slogan guy in an ad agency for a minute. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this is what they look like in the end. So we, uh, when we handed them out, we, we 
pre, we force everyone into a mobile first environment because it just makes it really easy and succinct, but you can use just blank pieces of paper that's in thirds. You can think about it in a desktop environment, you can think about it as in a physical environment, but you're essentially wanting to get these three main components of your thing, take all of that abstract idea, idea concepting and get it into what it would really look like in an interface. Um, take note of these little sticky dots because we're going we're gonna to talk about them later. Uh, the next step in solution sketching is art gallery. So like at the end of the Tuesday, which is when you're doing the solution sketches, um, you'll turn them all into the facilitator and you'll go on your merry way and talk about how lame your work is. This isn't a meeting all day. And, um, and then meanwhile, the facilitator is going to go and hang all of those solution sketches up on the wall with some level of anonymity. I mean, if you know your team, you're going to be able to recognize, like, oh, that's definitely Greg. But, like, it, essentially it's supposed to be fairly anonymous that when you come in the first thing on Wednesday, you have a whole gallery. And the reason it's called a gallery is because no one's allowed to talk in this time. And for the first um, however long you decide to gate the gallery period, that you're just going around and looking at everyone's solution, reading through them, trying to understand them, and kind of getting an idea of like which ones speak to you, which components are really cool, and you use sticky dots to um, highlight. You can, you're putting heat on, basically it's a heat map. And so you're creating all this heat on the components of the solution that you liked, and then you do speed critiques. So this here's, here's what voting idea. looks like. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk, talk about straw poll. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So the speed critiques are now you've gone and you've put heat sticker, heat mapped, all of these different things. So now the facilitator is going to come through after, the, after, all that, uh, heat, after all that voting has gone on and is going to ask um, what, what is it about this component you guys liked? And then as a group, people will say, oh, I really liked it, it did this, this, and then I'll write all those on sticky notes and stick them like right under that solution so that we can see the parts that people really gravitated to and why they gravitated to it. Or didn't like. Or didn't like, it's very important. Yeah. Sometimes somebody will put something up that they like and somebody else will be like, I hate this. And you have to be able to be frank like that in there. Nobody can have feelings about stuff. Feelings take time. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> So after you've hashed it out with a, um, I'm sure a very kind speed critique. Mm -hmm. uh, One that doesn't end in HR. You go to the straw poll <laughs> scenario. So, so then we're going to do straw poll, uh, which is more voting. This is voting heavy. Uh, but you only get one shot to pick your favorite. And there are a few boundaries that we add in here um, to ensure that everyone's vote is only influenced by their own opinion, which is um, number one, everyone's going to write their initials on the sticker. Um, so that there's no weird, du nobody's cheating, basically. Um, it happens. You wouldn't think so. There's only eight people, but it happens. Sometimes the cheating people just forget. They, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then, like, no pacing around. You, like, everybody basically lines up, and then you're like, go. And within the next, like, ten seconds, everybody better have their one vote on a solution. Um, the vote is non-binding, and that's because you can have weird distributions based on how many people are participating and where like, all of your solutions are, are ending up. If you have like, two really strong solutions and everyone's either on one side or the other, you will have people that will need to re-vote and remap. So it's, it's not really binding, but it does give us a good idea of where to head next. This is also a time where your decider might come in with their super vote, which is one of the things that we're skipping, we uh, or that Thursday. we did skip in Thursday, thankfully we didn't have to do super votes, but um, that's where the decider will pick a solution or multiples, like we mentioned, this would be, be where you diverge um, and separate into groups to tackle two totally separate solutions for the same problem. Um, and then there might be more voting after that too, if you want to, because like, sometimes the idea of even diverging is um, controversial. So you got to reconcile, like, who's adopting this? Oh, we don't have enough designers in the sprint team. Well, who's going to do this prototype? So um, uh, having impractical winners, that's like one of the scenarios. Um, if there are multiple favorites by the decider, because the decider can also say, I like all three of these. Go do this. Um, <clears throat> thankfully, we didn't have to do that yesterday. Right. Uh, so now you have a bunch of components. You're, at, um, you're still on Wednesday. This is, I believe, the end of Wednesday. And um, now you've got all of these things that you like and all of these different um, uh, proposed solution sketches. And 
you, you can kind of coalesce around those and say like, okay, now, now let's start saying like we're gonna pick. Usually the way we do it in the past, the way we've done it in the past is you pick one solution sketch, you get everyone to kind of get behind one, but then you can use those other components that you liked about others in the storyboarding part. That's where you say like, we're not just talking about these three pieces, there's, we know that there's 10 screens in this solution. So now's the time to kind of flesh out what, what will each of those screens look like, what opportunities have we figured out from our risks and assumptions and from these other solution sketches that we can incorporate into the storyboard because we think they're powerful aspects of the experience. Usually um, you yeah, limit this to what is realistic. We limited it a lot. We said like less than 15 and we only ended up doing like six, seven at six most. or seven. Yeah. Friends. yeah. Um, but again, like it says up there, the longer you make the storyboard, the longer it's going to take to test. And that means that you're going to have testers in the office for longer, which means you have to pay them more, and they eat more of your snacks, and they take more of your water, and they go use your bathroom, and you have to take breaks. So just keep it to like five or 15 so that it's manageable when you get to the part where you're actually testing And seriously, like in tests, like the users will, you'll get about 10% of the conversation is actually about the thing that you're testing, and then the rest is about opinions they have about everything in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this is what a storyboard looked like. You can do them on one sheet. You can dedicate whole sheets to them. There's really no right or wrong way to do it. Team A++ had some really good designers and really great handwriting, because this is tiny. Like, the other team used full sheets of the easel paper. They got their whole thing on the almost one. Yep. Um, but this is where you can get a little more uh, granular in what you want to describe. So here we have you know, Jane Doe, Bob Villa, and a bunch of other fake names, open slots, things like that. This is where you can kind of start to get into the details a bit more, figure out what you need to have uh, as a critical component of reaching like some level of believable fidelity in the prototype you eventually build. Um, and of course, you know, arrows are helpful in you know noting what triggers what. Um, uh, some of these are divergent too, so like in, at st uh, step three we have an email invoice, which we don't have a screen for, but we do need to account for, and it's part of the experience. So that's storyboarding, and then we get into design. So this is where we've, we want to kind of open up if you have a lot of questions at this point, because many of you are developers and may not feel comfortable with design. You should feel comfortable with design because everybody's a designer um, now. But, uh, <laughs> but these are, we've, we've listed some tools that are either free, um, part of an OS, uh, or offer a free trial period. So the, the number one, the, the one most buzzworthy is uh, called Figma. Has anyone heard of Figma or worked with Figma before? Our designer, our designer. So, uh, so Figma is kind of, they, their uh, defining feature is that they're like a multiplayer design environment where you can have multiple people working on the same uh, product at one time. So if you are in a sprint and you, need, you have like 15 storyboards to fulfill, then this is a good solution because you can have multiple designers on it and do things in tandem. Um, Does it support systems too? Yeah, it also supports design systems. A lot of you probably do work with uh, UI kits or design systems. Um, so that supports that as, as well as Sketch. Um, Sketch is pretty much the industry standard for UI design now. Um, it allows you to have libraries. Uh, there are a lot of like scripts that you can run in as plugins that allow you to like basically design without taking your hands off the keyboard. So if you guys like, and I'll bet you de you guys do like doing that, uh, not taking your hands off the keyboard and doing everything in like a command line kind of style, you can do that with Sketch. Um, there's like task runners for virtually anything. Um, Adobe XD, some of you might have design teams that work exclusively in the Adobe Creative Cloud. Uh, their latest contender is XD, which is actually now free. So if you haven't already downloaded it, just to check it out, Adobe XD is free, and you can poke around in there and build prototypes that go between screens um, using assets from stuff that you might already have on hand, like your marketing stuff. You can get to that level of realism using reusing assets you already have, especially if you're already uh, in the Creative Cloud. And then Keynote or PowerPoint, um, <clears throat> it's probably not your first thought to go to that for prototyping, but it has all the essentials. You can you know, have action buttons that go to frames that are non-sequential. You can have transitions. It has all the fundamentals of a good prototyping program. And Google Ventures, uh, um, the, the people that really develop the sprint process, or the product sprint process, um, they, that was one of their earliest test cases in using that. They use that for an interface for a robot, of all things. So you can get some cool results out of just stuff you have 
on your desktop or not hidden away somewhere that you don't want to touch. And then uh, draw.io, um, another free tool, uh, uh, works well with the G Suite stuff, which is really for like, um, it's usually for flows and diagramming and stuff like that, but they have built-in components, UI components, if you want to just get something in there and put some text in it, which is good enough in a lot of cases to test. Uh, I recommend draw.io too. Um, Prototyping, uh, I'll kind of handle yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thursday, you're going to be prototyping. Not everyone needs to be present on Thursday because having a bunch of people telling you how to make this thing slide left or right is terribly annoying. <laughs> uh, and I um, recommend you just kind of boil it down to a core team of maybe a content designer or someone who's willing to take on that role and someone who's also willing to play designer for the day. Um, <clears throat> You will have check-ins frequently with other team members, um, especially people from like marketing, customer support, uh, copywriters make sure that your tone is right. You don't wanna put a product out there that you know, maybe has a bunch of language that you'd never use or is on your never say list. Um, it happens. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's Thursday, um, and there's a lot of back and forth, but really there's only two core people working through that, and they're gonna be using prototyping tools. Um, has anyone here, aside from our designer in, on the, in the room, because I know he's, 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 okay. Are there any designers in the room that have used Envision, UX Pen, Origami, or Principle? Okay, cool, so what do you guys use typically? Envision, everyone's Envision? Everyone's Envision, damn. Uh, so Envision is actually probably the most limited prototyper uh, as of right now, um, considering that their, their um, design tools are still really in beta. Um, they got here first, but they, did, they haven't been keeping up. But well. compared to the competition, they, they don't offer a lot. Um, UX Pen, you'll see the power of UX Pen later. We don't get paid by UX Pen. In fact, we still have to pay for UX Pen, even though we talk about it all the time in our presentation. Um, UX Pen is a really powerful all-in-one tool that, that, that like beat Figma to multiplayer design years ago. Um, they also do, there's like heavy versioning. You can do all of your prototyping animation in it. They support multiple design systems. They've had symbols before Sketch had symbols. Um, it's it's an, a really an all-in-one uh, tool. And the best part of using something like UX Pen is handoff to developers. Um, if, you, if your design team, if you have problems with handoff and your design team doesn't really know the solution, you might want to try UX Pen because um, it's actually, um, it breaks down everything to a component level versus like when you get uh, an InVision file, you may be familiar with this, or like you, you inspect it, right, and you've only got enough to figure out what the background color is. UX Pen is better at giving you most of the, the core components. At uh, once, and then there's Origami. Um, origami is mostly for uh, mobile prototypes, but it's uh, Facebook's. Um, it's like a modular interface. It's very complex. You can do a lot with it, um, but it's based on uh, the uh, Mac OS's Quartz backbone for uh, prototyping um, or animation. And then Principle, which is super easy, and there's a free trial, and it's like keyframing, so you just timeline. So you're like, when I press this button, I want this thing to go there. It's that easy, um, and it exports really beautiful GIFs and stuff like that, so you're, yes? So, yeah, so, so there's a lot of overlap, but um, these tools, um, are, are design oriented. And then the prototyping tools, like Envision in particular, they do have a, a set of design tools, but it's not necessarily what you're, like what most teams are using right now because they're in beta maybe in a lot of cases. Um, UX Pin, um, it does have a design system in it, but a lot of times you might be bringing in assets from elsewhere instead because it reads Sketch and Photoshop files. Um, so you'd be, you'd be hooking the components up instead in there and more so building interactions. Uh, origami is strictly for that, as is principle. Um, yes? Just to amend, like, we use Envision to have a click-through prototype that we can send to clients and have them actually see the interaction versus actually working the like, sketch file. Yeah. So. And uh, thank you. Yeah, that, this, all of these things that we're talking about all have to do with what fidelity you want your prototype to be, too, right? Like, you can do a prototype on paper. You can just draw the thing out and say, like, how do you react to this? What would you push? You know, like, 
technically you can do that. Um, UX pin and InVision make it feel more like you're really using the interface. Um, InVision does a decent job of it, but it's still sort of linear. You know, you can just go page to page. It won't necessarily like let you hot button to a thing later on. Or whereas UX pin, you can really like people we, that we test with often think that we've coded this. This is a real thing that they're using. Yeah, you'll see uh, in the prototype that we shared that um, it allows for micro interactions that you may be struggling to incorporate otherwise. So like having a, a like an uh, OS level alert that they got an email on a screen that's in your app is sometimes harder to do in other places. Uh, yes? I don't want to do, yeah, I don't want to derail you guys. No. Well. You not. So I was just curious that you've been using your expand. Like we use a vision mainly just to get like a story out there. Mm -hmm. So we can get feedback on it quickly and we use like the graph plugin. Mm -hmm. So we can take it and we have like it's sketch whatever for all our, all our stuff, right? So build a prototype, sync it up to Envision, wire up the clicks, whatever. Yeah. And then we can just have a conversation. Do you find that for us, I feel like that's pretty quick. Um, do you find you spend more time with UXPIN because it offers like uh, all those inter like the, a deeper level of interaction? Because I agree, like Envision, is, it only goes so far. Right. Like, at right. some point, you're like, all right, we got to code this. You know, like, we're going to have to build a more robust prototype. Yeah, it, it's a great question, and it really relies on um, scoping with your own design team, like. I've had designers that will go through and make everything like pixel perfect, but really doesn't is not uh, essential to the inter the core interaction, right? Um, so yes, it absolutely can happen, and that's where Envision really works well, is because it limits you to what you need to uh, fundamentally understand it. Um, for smaller, for more like minutia, UX Pin really works uh, much better than Envision in some cases. I think a good example to the answer that. Uh, the question that you just asked, too, is that ye yesterday, or Thursday, right after we got done with the workshop, we took storyboards that the teams had made, and within, what, three hours? Uh, an hour and a half. Hour and a half, the design of that prototype, but that we turned that into a prototype with UX pen in like a very short, quick period of time. Yeah, so uh, just to illustrate how that worked. <laughs> no, you were there, too, for like, it was in your uh, room, so. <laughs> Uh, so here's here's like some of the places that we landed uh, with our teams um, who yeah, really so killed it yesterday the other this day. This was the one team, like I said, they, they, both teams decided to kind of pick the same problem to work with. So here's like what they sketched up just on a piece of paper in the workshop, and then here's the design that Ian did from it. And you can see that like Ian didn't even have to engage his brain. He just said, "I'll no. just do what you did." Yeah. Um, and then this is. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I wish my regular job was like this. <laughs> And then this was a, a screenshot from the storyboard uh, that the other team had done because they got this piece done really well. And then this is his interpretation of that. And that's UX Pin? UX yes. Um, so uh, here's what UX Pin looks like in practice. Um, sorry, I'll restart it here. Um, but this is, on, this is in um, Mobile Safari. Um, the text fields are fully functional. Uh, you can have logic in it. Um, you'll see in the upcoming piece that there is a little micro interaction. So the thank you, and then John got a notification from his email. Um, the surveys are functional in, in the way that it looks like you're filling it out. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the, the fidelity, just so you guys, you guys probably speak this language better than actual designers, but the fidelity of the output of products like UX Pen uh, that use um, HTML as their core uh, versus just like graphics or um, SVGs to represent things. Um, if you put a login field and a password field, like these just these basic inputs uh, in a UX pin prototype, enter text in it in the preview and hit return, your browser will ask you if you want to save that, which is like a, you know convincing for on, on a level that we, it's really hard to reach with other tools. Um, so it's, it's really good if you want people to have like that really higher fidelity, like um, what I'm used to working in, this is what my browser does all the time. Um, <clears throat> question? Do uh, tools like UX Pen, these prototyping tools, if, if your group already has like a components repo or some sort of living style guide or something, mm -hmm. can you import those and just like even make it even more direct to like, yeah. Yeah, so um, a few tools like uh, do work that way. Um, I think uh, Envision reads um, 
sketch files. So if you if you like need it, if it's just for inspection, then you can. Um, UX pin, I don't want to make this like all about UX pin, even though it's very good and useful, but um, you can import sketch or PSDs into core components based on how you structure the file. Um, and so, and additionally, like things like Figma, um, Figma and sketch, uh, depending on, on how you're using them, can output React um, natively. So there's a lot of cool stuff that, that um, you can integrate with those as well. So we got five minutes left. Um, we got a couple slides to shoot through. I, I oh. got us out of it. Okay. Uh, the tests, like I'll give this stuff to you guys when we deliver all this stuff, but basically you just want to be asking open-ended questions. So I wrote tests while he was designing the thing, and then what you saw a video there was, uh, was of me just watching somebody use it. I asked them open-ended questions like, what do you think you're supposed to do here? And they'll ask you stuff like, oh, well, if I enter this, will it? And you have to just kind of be like, I can answer all your questions later, but thank you for asking me that. Keep going. What else does this make you think? You really want to harvest as many of their thoughts and not monopolize any of that time with answers until you're done with the test. And then, of course, answer all their questions. You're not trying to be a jerk. <laughs> but it's just so that you don't get all, all derailed on, like, let's talk about it. Just say, what do you think should happen here? Is that what you assume would happen here? You know, and, and keep it open-ended. And then if they try to focus in a little bit, then focus their questioning. Like, just ask them the question back. And you have to kind of establish that with them at the beginning. There's sort of some rules around the tests that are outlined in the next slide. But I want to give them Q&A time. OK, yeah. So quick user testing tips. Uh, tell them you didn't design it. Even if you're lying, it makes them feel like they're not going to hurt your feelings. Uh, lie your way through it. Um, always. <laughs> Ask for advice and not feedback. It's a subtle change in the language. You get the same output. But when you're asking for feedback, you're inviting them to be overly critical. Um, or maybe they'll be, like, they'll be too thoughtful and you'll run out of time because they, they want to make sure it's very strategic. Advice feels like, personally, to me, this is how I think I would do it. Um, you'll get better results out of it, guaranteed. Um, also remind them that you're not testing them, you're just testing the design. They can't screw up anything. If it's broken, it's our fault, not theirs. Um, well, not our fault, whoever designed it. Whoever designed it, right, <laughs> not me. What a moron. Uh, that can, by the way, that can go too far, too. Um, ask open-ended questions, like we mentioned. Um, again, postpone uh, answering their independent questions. Um, until after the test is done, and then also have someone taking notes. And if you can't have someone taking notes, record the whole thing and take notes afterward. Uh, so the next day, I'll try to get through this. Um, OK, so testing synthesis. You want to regroup with the team on at Friday. This would be afternoon Friday. And look at all of the user sessions you've conducted. You only need five to seven. Um, if you have questions about sourcing them, you can, we'll be here for a little bit, and, and we can help you through that, because we have a lot of unique ways of approaching that, especially if you're doing something really lean or you have no money. Um, uh, so you're going to regroup with the team, look at the highlights uh, from your user tests, especially if you have video. Those are super, super helpful. Otherwise, just review the notes. Um, discuss this, what was successful and what was unsuccessful. Talk about why that happened. Um, keep a list of specific feedback uh, from your testers so that you can go back and look at that later and prioritize. That's the next step. You're, gonna, you're basically going to go back to score one and say, like, here's where we are. Here are all the problems. Are these high levels of effort? Do we need to? Do this again. If it was unsuccessful and you have a lot of problems, you may need to rerun the sprint, especially if you're just starting out with a new product. You might want to go back and say, like, here's what we learned in sprint one. We have to come at it from a different angle. Or maybe we're solving for the wrong problem. Um, and if it was a success, then you start moving into your product pipeline or your development cycle afterward. But it's pretty straightforward after that, and it's really dependent on how your org works. So questions, comments, criticism, these are our Twitter handles. <laughs> Yes? Any tips on like, selling this to upper management? Oh, so, man, that's a good question. <laughs> um, we could have a whole session just on that. <laughs> so, so the best way to, to sell it, of course, is um, to look at the timeline. You're, you're asking a lot of people to have you know, dedicated days inside that room, right? That's the biggest hurdle most of the time. Yeah. Um, to, to look at their salaries, basically, and say, for this many hours, this is the output that you get, and we didn't spend any of this development time. Because to get this far, to test it with a totally functional prototype would take at least two weeks of multiple developers and, and designers, and then it still has to go through the same process. And you still have to test it. Um, so there's a lot of ways to talk about ROI on UX in general, but most of the time it's like, just 
look at it from hours. Also, That's being persistent about like the data and analytics that you know are indicative of the problem. You know, like you know, there's a big mm -hmm. problem that needs to be solved. And the more like like a like drip torture, like the more they can see, like yeah, we had four more bounces yesterday. Yeah, like you know what I mean. Like yeah. if you can stay on them, we we found that we had to kind of go rogue and start doing some testing on stuff that was being made that had not gone through this process. And we had some good software called Lookback where we were able to do these unmoderated tests where we would send them to people. They would start their session and we would see their screen and their face. And yeah. we would hear them talking through it. And we found that people were really, really frustrated with our alpha product. Right. And we were still moving forward with it. Like, it's great. We love it because our CEO loved it and the founder loved it. And that meant we were going to build it no matter what. And then we started showing like this. You want to give this to the world? You want to make people feel the way this person feels? And, like, yeah, that's, that's actually great. Um, if, you, if you manage to run one and like, you have good output from it, and your, maybe your leadership team is on the fence about doing it again, um, but you see value in it, and you probably will. Um, show them your worst user test. It makes the, like our, our the, previously at the org that we were working with, we were doing these very regularly. We showed them the first one, and this girl's like going through this product, and she, she gets has, like, like a background in like national she, security. Yeah, and it says like it was a, it was an HR tech product, and and the first go around at our you know machine learning, what have you, um, suggested that, it, that she become a bus driver. And her, her feedback in doing this unmoderated test was, it makes me feel like shit. And so we played that, like, basically on loop. She was like, like, like hey. She, like, said to whoever was in the room, that, that pretty much makes me feel like I suck. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that, so, excuse like, me. that like, <laughs> hit the founder, like, in the chest. Then he was like, oh, man, I never even, you know what I mean? It was just, Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes. Find any major like, differences between like B2B and B2C design? Yes. Yeah, um, a lot of B2B organizations don't do this type of uh, design sprints. They usually get their feedback directly from the clients. And um, because uh, they, in those scenarios, they usually have a, a built up uh, consumer base of people that are already paying for the product and ingrained in the system, legacy clients, stuff like that. Um, they don't really run these because it's, um, a lot of stuff they already know. And, well, and, and they, they're not they solving big usage. problems, but yeah, well that too, they can force you to do it. But they're not solving big problems. Um, you already have an existing product in a lot of the B2B cases. Of course, there are, there are a lot of cases where it is totally valid to run it in a B2B scenario, but B2C... And I would say it's gonna happen more and more as consumer products become the norm and people expect, even if you're at work, you still expect it to work like Facebook works or like Snapchat works, so... I think that's, that's, that's probably one of our major problems. Yeah. Hey, we, we, have a, we have a design system, we, we have designers on staff, mm -hmm. but it's really confusing for designers coming to staff because they're used to a B2C e to type of thinking, right. right. whereas like our users, are like, or where they're making things more clear, more readable, yeah. our users expect actually like data density, they want something that's more like Excel, right. like yeah. Google right. or Facebook. Right? It, it's also a little harder to find users for this scenario. Yeah. So five days of time to get in front of a very specific consumer, like you may have as your existing customers, is more challenging than us going to, like in the, in the worst scenario, going to Amazon Turkers and doing qual quantitative testing. Uh, but we can also get people off Craigslist for a $50 Amazon card that day most of the time. Um, so it's a little easier when it's just the man on the street. I would also say that in the B2B environment, like you, that, that forced user, the person that has to use the thing, they're a lot more open to spill in their guts about everything they hate about it. So you can get a lot of feedback <laughs> from those people. Whereas on a consumer basis, they just bounce. And you're not sure exactly why they bounced and it's hard to figure out why they un uninstalled your app or whatever. So there are some advantages to being in that as far as the feedback loop is concerned. If you have like, a, if you're working with a place that has they're solving a problem that's, that's complex. How do you break it down into like multiple uh, design sprints or what scoping do you give a design sprint? What, like what's a good scope? It's a good question, and I think it depends on the actual product in a lot of ways, or the, or the scope of, the, of that project. But if the thing is, like, we need to fix our onboarding, I would say the design sprint, you focus on one user's experience, whoever you're prominent, most of the biggest user is, and you focus on one piece of that puzzle. So if it's, like, they're bouncing halfway through onboarding, then we're just going to work on onboarding. And we're just going to figure out, like, for this main, the blue sky scenario, for this main thing, we're going to prototype around that, 
And then you would go back and say, like, now, okay, now how do we include the, the, the software engineer that we weren't considering because we were only thinking about the tech manager? These people sometimes want to go buy their own tickets. Are we forcing them to feel like they're a jerk because they don't have a coupon code or they don't yeah. have a bulk thing of tickets? So it's just being focused enough that you get that core piece of it. And sometimes it's troubleshooting. You know, this piece already exists, but it's not working. How do we fix it? But it, the, the trick is, like, I would say you try to get as focused in as you can. Um, without limiting your choices and, and your options. So maybe like take one, one persona in the journey and then like the hot spot of that journey and then just focus yeah. on that first. Yeah. And then or kind of build out from there. If yeah. you have customer feedback or user feedback and you have a good backlog of problems and you can group them, um, you can also do another matrix of level of effort versus value uh, to the user and then just find out what the highest target is, and, and if you need to solve it with a sprint, if it's not like a, you know, just a, uh, some four weeks of development time, right? You don't need to do a sprint for that, but if it requires some design and some thinking, then that's a good candidate. And also, you can do like a full, the full sprint on that blue sky main person, and then you might say like, okay, well, we need to include the secondary and ancillary users in this equation, so you don't have to do a whole other five-day design sprint, but you might come back and like, let's spend two more days just thinking about these other pieces. Um, and you can use some of the extra, pull any exercises that help you get that done. You've already done the full design sprint, so you guys are already in the pace, the inertia, like, um, it, so you don't have to do like, okay, now we have to do another five days because we forgot about this thing, you know, or whatever. So, you know, or whatever, so I like to end my sessions. <laughs> <laughs> so we recently uh, redesigned an application 16 years old, huge web sphere application. Um, and Wrangling with legacy code. Up into kind of like areas of functionality, right? But yeah. Mm -hmm. We used kind of a six week design period. Do you think that this would uh, prevent us from, now we're going back and redesigning screens and we should be captured six, you know? Well, you do need to work it into your cycle um, and give it a lot of lead time. Uh, for a rule for us, um, we usually recommend having a design sprint completed two sprints ahead of when it's actually slated to hit development. That gives you enough time if you have to go back and do the sprint over again or you know refine it. You have enough time to do so if you need to. Otherwise, you have plenty of lead time with your uh, other teams, like your design team, your marketing team, your development team, to scope it out. Uh, and be pretty accurate. So in, in our case, like whenever something would come up, like oh, this is it's, you're in the road mapping meeting, and someone said oh, we're telling you now that there's this other feature that we're going to add, or we need to improve this particular. So as soon as like that is said in the meeting, we say all right, when do we decide to build the design sprint? Right, like that's step one. So you have multiple of these design sprints throughout the course of the project. Yes. yes. Okay. Depending on its complexity. But yeah. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Sorry we were on. Thank you.